welcome. We begin with United States' long-awaited 2024 election. Trump projected as 47% of the United States. Talib Omar re-elected as first Muslim women in Congress. GOP takes U.S. Senate ending two years of Democrat control. Russia denies ties to bomb threats at key U.S. polling sites. And Netanyahu buys Defense Minister Garland after war disputes. Stay with me for these and more stories. On U.S. 2024 election on the night of Tuesday to Wednesday, a sleepless night that has been the reality for millions of U.S. citizens. Several election workers around the country are up and voters at watch parties keep an eye on the counting. Donald Trump will win the battleground states of Pennsylvania, Georgia and North Carolina projections show shrinking Kamala Harris's possible path to victory. In a speech to supporters, Trump said he will usher in a golden age of America. Trump and Harris each need at least 270 electoral votes to win the presidency. Vote counting is still underway in key states including in the battleground state of Arizona, Michigan, Wisconsin, and Nevada. Republicans will win in the Senate, a flip that shifts the balance of power in Washington. Hours earlier, former President Donald Trump around in Palm Beach to cast his ballot. His major contender, Kamala Harris, voted a couple of days earlier. Polls closed later than scheduled in states including Nevada as voters waited in long lines to make their voice heard. A series of bomb threats across multiple battleground states and obstantiated claims of wrongdoing by the former president disrupted an otherwise smooth election day. Former Sabriel, the Philadelphia election commissioner, said, according to reports, that we had a beautiful day, a beautiful election. We're seeing high turnout from reports that I have. And to be clear, Philadelphia elections are safe, simple and secure, and they have always been. There is no cheating. There is no smoke to eat. People say things, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it's true with Londoners in 2020. We have hardworking people trying to give the citizens of America the election that they deserve. Early Wednesday, results started to come in for the U.S. Senate and House of Representatives. Trump has captured two of the seven key swing states and secured the lead in four others. A top Harris ally sent supporters home from her rally with no plans for the Democratic vice president to speak. Still in U.S. 2024 election, the first two Muslim women to serve in the United States Congress, the Democratic parties Rashida Tlaib and Lilian Omar, have won re-election to the U.S. House of Representatives. On Tuesday, Tlaib, who is also the first woman of Palestinian descent in the U.S. Congress, was re-elected for a fourth term as a representative for Michigan with support from the large Arab American community in Dearborn. Omar, a former refugee and Somali-American, took, retook her seat for a third term in Minnesota, where she represents the strongly Democratic 5th District, which includes Minneapolis and a number of suburbs. A leading critic of U.S. military support to Israel in its war in Gaza, Tlaib ran uncontested in her primary and defeated Republican James Hooper to represent the solidly Democratic District in Devon and Detroit. In a post, Omar thanked her supporters for all their hard work in her election campaign. Our hard work was worth it. We knocked on 117,716 doors. We made 108,226 calls and we sent 147,323 texts. This is a victory for all of us who believe that a better future is possible. I can't wait to make you all proud over the next two years, she said. Talib and Omar are both members of the informal group of lawmakers known as the SCORD, which is made up of the progressive members of Congress, including Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez, among others. Other SCORD members, Jamal Bowman of New York and Cory Bush of Missouri, both lost their party primaries against opponents who had won substantial support from the pro-Israel fundraising group America Israel Public Affairs Committee, IPAC. The group has invested over $100 million in U.S. political races this year in a bid to silence pro-Palestine voices in the Congress. Still sticking with U.S. 2024 election, the Republican Party has reclaimed control of the United States Senate, ending two years of leadership from the Democrat. Tuesday's general election saw a third of the upper chamber in Congress, all 34 seats hit the ballot, of which almost nine were competitive. The Democrats were vulnerable to losing their hold on the chamber, giving the narrow majority a coalition of four independent senators and 47 Democrats gave the party 
its 51 person majority out of a total of 100 possible seats. The party needed to defend every seat possible in order to retain control. But on Tuesday, two key defeats decisively put the power over the Senate back in Republican hands. Democratic incumbent Sherrod Brown lost his bid for re-election in the western state of Ohio. Meanwhile, in West Virginia, Republicans picked up a seat formerly held by retiring independent Senator Joe Manchin. The Republican Party also successfully defended a vulnerable seat in Texas held by Senator Ted Cruz. Tuesday was Cruz's second time beating back a Democratic contender angling to take his seat. Meanwhile, in Nebraska, another Republican incumbent, Deb Fish, fended off an upstart challenge from independent candidate Dan Osborne, who made the race a nail beater in its final weeks. The shift in control over the Senate could pave the way for Republicans to hold both parties, both chambers rather, and Congress, which will give the party power over the legislative agenda for at least the next two years. Now, Moscow has described as malicious slander reports that fake bomb threats directed at polling locations and four battleground states in the United States election, that's Georgia, Michigan, Arizona, and Wisconsin, originated from Russian email domains and were part of an interference operation. Many polling sites aimed by the SCARS in Georgia were briefly evacuated on Tuesday. The U.S.'s Federal Bureau of Investigation, FBI, said in a statement that none of the threats have been determined by credible thus far, noting that many of the hoax bomb warnings appear to originate from Russia email domains. An FBI official said Georgia received over two dozen threats, most of which occurred in Fulton County, which encompasses much of Atlanta, a Democratic Party stronghold. Threats against 32 of the 177 polling stations in Fulton County, Georgia, led to five locations being briefly evacuated. The locations reopened after closely 30 minutes, officials said, and the county was seeking a court order to extend the location's voting hours past the statewide 7 p.m. local time deadline for closing. The FBI is aware of bomb threats to polling stations and locations in many states, several of which seem to originate from Russian email domains. None of the threats have been determined to be credible thus far. About an hour before polls were closed, officials in DeKalb County, Georgia, said they received bomb threats against five polling places. Officials in the overwhelmingly Democratic suburbs said voting had been suspended at the locations until police confirmed there were no bombs. A court order will be sought to extend voting, which is routine in Georgia when a polling place is disrupted, officials said. Bomb threats were also sent to two polling locations in Wisconsin State capital, Madison, but did not disrupt voting, the head of the Wisconsin Elections Commission, Ann Jacobs, said. A spokesperson for Joyce Lynn Benson, Michigan's Democratic Secretary of State, said there had been reports of bomb threats at several polling locations, but none was credible. Benson's office had been notified that the threats may be tied to Russia, according to the spokesperson. Andrew and Fort, uh, Democrats and Arizona Secretary of State, the chief election official in the swing state, said four fake bomb threats had also been delivered to polling sites in Navajo County, Arizona. Georgia's Republican Secretary of State, Brad Raffensperger, laid the blame directly on Russia. The Russian embassy in Washington, D.C. said insinuations about Russian interference in the election were malicious slander. U.S. intelligence officials have accused Russia of interfering in previous U.S. presidential elections, especially through cyber operations in the 2016 race, which the current Republican presidential candidate Donald Trump won against Democratic candidate Hillary Clinton. Away from U.S. 2024 election now to Israel, Benjamin Netanyahu, Israeli Prime Minister, has fired Defense Minister Yaov Gallant after months of clashes over domestic politics and Israel's war efforts. On Tuesday evening, in a recorded statement, Netanyahu said, Trust between me and the Minister of Defense has cracked. Israel cards presently the Foreign Minister will become Defense Minister. Gideon Saar will be replaced cards as Foreign Minister. The Prime Minister's office said on Tuesday, neither has extensive military experience, though cards has served in the cabinet throughout the war. The step came as voters in the United States, Israel's most significant ally, voted for the next president. Gallant is a close interlocutor interlocutor for the U.S. administration and has been said to have daily conversations with U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin. 
The reshuffle took place at a crucial moment for Israel, which is fighting bloody wars in Gaza and Lebanon, while awaiting a potential retaliatory attack from Iran. Gallant responded to the decision shortly after it was made public that the security of Israel has been and will always be my lifelong mission. In a televised statement, he said his dismissal was the result of a dispute over three things. The issue of ultra-Orthodox military service, the abandonment of hostages in Gaza, and the need for an official inquiry into Hamas's October 7th attack. There isn't and won't be forgiveness for abandoning the hostages, he said. This will be a mark of Cain that the Israeli society bears as well as those leading through this wrong path. Netanyahu said on Tuesday he had made many attempts to bridge differences with Garland, but that they kept widening and came to the public's knowledge in an unacceptable manner. He continued, worse than that, they came to the knowledge of the enemy. Our enemies enjoyed it and greatly benefited from it. Israel's political class has long guessed that Netanyahu will fire Gallant and replace him with a political ally to show off his domestic power. Netanyahu has fought to maintain a hold over his fragile right-wing governing coalition and its model of competing as interests whose collapse could spell the end of his leadership. When Netanyahu first sought to fire Gallant last year over his opposition to proposed judicial reforms, it led to massive nationwide demonstrations. Minutes after Netanyahu made the announcements, opposition leaders called for Israelis to take to the streets in protests. On climate crisis, Hurricane Rafael strengthens in the Caribbean path to U.S. uncertain. On Tuesday night, Rafael lashed the Cayman Islands in the Western Caribbean with strong winds and heavy rain, and the Category 1 hurricane is anticipated to keep strengthening before it makes landfall in Cuba on Wednesday. Rafael is the 11th hurricane of the 2024 Atlantic hurricane season. Forecasters are cautioning there's more uncertainty than usual about where the storm could go once it's in the Gulf of Mexico midweek. It's possible, possible Rafael, which had maximum sustained winds of 80 MPH on Tuesday night, could affect the Gulf Coast this weekend or miss it entirely and drive into northeastern Mexico so residents in those areas will need to monitor updates closely. Forecasts should become clearer over the next 48 hours. Three things are clear now. The storm will be weakening on approach in the Gulf and is not projected to be as extreme as Hurricanes Helene and Milton. Tropical storm conditions could start in the lower and middle Florida Keys by Wednesday and the Caribbean will face the worst of the storm. Hurricane and tropical storm alerts were in place for most of Cuba and the Cayman Islands as Rafael began to pass through the Caymans on Tuesday night. The Hurricane Center said people in the Caymans should expect dangerous storm surge and destructive waves. According to the National Hurricane Center, the storm will rapidly intensify over the next 24 hours and is forecast to be a Category 2 hurricane as it nears landfall in western Cuba on Wednesday. Hurricane force winds could impact parts of the Cayman Islands late on Tuesday and, Wednesday, and western Cuba by Wednesday. Rafael's potent winds will also create rough seas and significant storm surge with expected inundation of up to three feet in the Cayman Islands and as much as nine feet in western Cuba above normal tide levels. Rafael could bring widespread rainfall for three to six inches from Jamaica to western Cuba with double digit totals possible for areas stuck under multiple rounds of torrential tropical rain. This deluge raises the risk of flash flooding and mudslides, especially in Jamaica's mountainous regions. The U.S. State Department advised Americans in Cuba who wanted to leave to depart now ahead of tropical storm Rafael's arrival. It also suggested U.S. citizens scheduled to travel there can reconsider their plans. Americans are banned from traveling to Cuba for pure tourism but are permitted to go for family visits and educational activities. The State Department also authorized its non-emergency employees and family members to voluntarily leave the island ahead of the storm. Meanwhile, in African scenes, UK-South Africa signs deals to boost trade and defense ties. David Lamy, United Kingdom Foreign Secretary, has signed bilateral agreements in Cape Town with his South African counterpart. The discussions he held with Ronald Lamola were targeted at boosting the ties between the two nations, which have agreed to bolster trade and defense relations. During meetings, Lamy reiterated his position on African representation at the United Nations, stating, 
The UK has had a long-standing position that Africa must be represented on the United Nations Security Council, and I'm keen to better understand if the recent position is supported by other members of the Security Council, particularly Russia and China. For his part, Rona Lamola insisted that the UK is a major partner for South Africa. Lamola, in his opening remarks, said he wished to acknowledge what he called the close bonds of friendship between two, the two countries and their people. But he added there was room for improvement, pointing out that trade and investment between the nations has prospered somewhat, in part as a result of the pandemic. We take a breather now. When we come back, I'll bring you more stories, particularly from Nigeria. Stay tuned. You're welcome back. And now stories from Nigeria. We begin with nationwide blackout as grid faces 10th collapse in 2024. On Tuesday, Nigerians were plunged into darkness following another collapse of the national power grid. According to reports, since January 2024 till date, the grid has collapsed 10 times. Within one week in October, the grid collapsed three times with its attendant blackouts sparking reactions from Nigerians. Report confirmed yesterday that the grid lost power generation around 1.50 p.m. As of 1 p.m., power generation was 2,711 megawatts. At 12 p.m., it was 3,631 megawatts. Earlier, power generation peaked at 3,934.77 megawatts around 6 o'clock in the morning. Between 2 p.m. and 3 p.m. local time, however, hourly generation dropped to 0, 0.00 megawatt. The 22 power generation plants on the grid lost power supply at the time of the incident. The transmission company of Nigeria, TCN, it confirmed the development saying the national grid experienced a partial disturbance at about 1.52 p.m. local time on 15 November 2024. TCN spokesperson Indidi Mba said, and I quote, these followed a series of lines and generators stripping that caused instability of the grid and consequently the partial disturbance of the system. Mba said data from the National Control Center revealed that a part of the grid was not affected by the bulk power disruption. TCN engineers are already working to quickly restore bulk power supply to the state affected by the partial disturbance. Presently, bulk power supply has been restored to Abuja at 2.49 p.m. and we are gradually restoring to other parts of the country. We sincerely apologize for every inconvenience this may cause our electricity customers, she, he said. According to reports, the power outage caused by the grid collapse affected both the north and the south. And finally on the news, talking judicial matters, court dropped treason charges against hashtag and bad governance protesters. On Tuesday, the fe federal high court sitting in Abuja threw out the treason charge brought against the minors accused by the Inspector General of Police IGP for participating in the August hashtag and bad governance protest. Justice Obiora Ogwatsu struck out the charge following its withdrawal by the Attorney General of the Federation, AGF, and the Minister of Justice, Pris Latif Fagbeni's son, on behalf of the federal government. The AGF, represented by the Director of Public Prosecution of the Federation, DPPF, Mohamed Abubakar, had at the proceedings on Tuesday, announced his exercise of Section 174, Subsection 1 and Subsection B and C, of the 1999 Constitution as amended and 108 of the Administration of Criminal Justice Act ACJA 2015 to take over the case from the IGP. Upon the grant of the request by Justice Ogwatu, the AGF continued to request for invocation of the same section of the Constitution to discontinue the trial of the accused persons. Following a no objection to the request from various lawyers representing the accused persons, Justice Iguatu granted the request and struck out the charges against the hashtag and bad governance protesters. Although the accused persons were not in court, the judge ordered their immediate release from the prison custody. On Monday, Preston Bola Tinibu had directed the AGF to terminate the treason charges preferred against the accused persons, who are mostly minors and prohibited by law from facing such trial. Remember that Justice Iguatu last Friday admitted that admitted the 114 Iranian protesters to a 10 billion naira bill each with 10 shorties in like sums. 
The protesters were arraigned on a 10-count chart bordering on treasonable felony, rioting, destruction of public property, assaulting security officials, and looting, among others, to which they pleaded not guilty to. Earlier before the proceedings commenced on Friday, there was a drama in the courtroom as four of the minors looking very malnourished fainted as they approached the dock for arraignment with their lawyers rushing to provide aid. The prosecuting counsel applied to the court for four suspects who earlier fainted to get first aid and be arraigned later. The arraignment of the protesters on charges bordering on treason attracted condemnation by some individuals and groups which made President Tinubu to order their release from detention. A recap of major stories says Trump projected as 47th President of the United States. Talib and Omar re-elected as first Muslim women in Congress. GOP takes U.S. Senate ending two years of Democrat control. Russia denies ties to bomb threats at key U.S. polling stations. And Netanyahu fires Defense Minister Garland after war disputes. And that's all in the news. Thanks for watching. Enjoy the rest of your day.